For those of you who have been with us for the past several weeks, you know that I have been involved in a series called the Holy Spirit Dependency. How do we live in dependency to the Holy Spirit? And today I want to speak for just a few minutes about what it means to have a Holy Spirit receptive life. When I started this series, I did indicate to you that there would be moments of teaching that would come as a result of questions that were asked, and, and, and some of what has taken place last week and this week, and for those of you that may not have been a part of this, you can certainly go online and catch up with everything, comes as a result of questions about from, from either new believers or believers that may be just entering in that come from different backgrounds that have a lot of questions as it relates to what does it mean to live in dependency upon the Holy Spirit. And today there's a couple of verses that I want to share with you. One of them is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 22, and it says, Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. And avoid every kind of evil. The second verse that I want to launch from today is found in Galatians 5, verse 25, that says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. So, Father, as we approach Your Word this morning, we recognize that we will draw nothing from this unless Your Holy Spirit leads and guides us into this. And so, Father, we come to You today and ask that You would open the eyes of our hearts open the eyes of our spirits, challenge the boundaries that we have set for you so that in that act of obedience you might lead us and guide us into greater truth and certainly into greater maturity in our walk with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Back in the 1980s, there was a commercial by the American Express card that introduced a statement that became something that was rather famous. I think it was Carl Molden that was originally uh, scheduled on those commercials, and perhaps you have heard it. It said, the American Express card, don't leave home with... (laughs) Don't you wish we could memorize Scripture (laughs) as quickly as we memorize commercials? It's amazing how those things stay in our mind. I started thinking that in the culture we live in today, what would it be that we would never want to leave home without? And as I was thinking about this, I ran outside to take my wife's car to go get gas and discovered about a mile away that I had forgot my cell phone. And even though I was only going to be gone for about 10 minutes, the thought crossed my mind, should I go back home and get it because I might miss something? Now, I know that never happens to any of you, but it began to dawn on me that maybe, rather than the American Express home, don't leave home without it, the one thing today in our culture that we would never leave home without would be our cell phones. So here's what I would like you to do. I would like every one of you to take your cell phone. I know that normally we're asking you to silence them and and put them away, but I recognize also that many of you have your Bibles on them, and, and if you could only see what I see. I have people tell me every week, I am just taking notes, and I'm going, then why did you celebrate on my third point when that was not a cell? You were playing a game. Uh, But I want you to take your phones in your hands today because I really want you to use them during some of this because generally it's always in your hand or it's in your pocket or it's in your purse. And it's always something that's become an indispensable tool. We depend on it. We look to it many times a day. In fact, we probably look at our phone more than we talk to the Holy Spirit. It is constantly becomes a necessity to us. In fact, I just looked up some statistics that I thought you might be interested in in 2024. 90% of drivers admit to using their mobile phones while driving. 97% of American adults own a cell phone of some kind. 87% of young adults admit that they will never, ever leave their phone behind. 35% of people admit that they use their phones during a meal with other people. The average American checks their smartphone 352 times a day. Just stop for a second. That's average. That means those of you that are in the 49th percentile and higher, check it more often than that. And for those of us that check it lower, this is where we bring the median to. 71% of married people spend more time on their phone than talking with their spouse. When divided by country, 
China has the highest usage, followed by India and then the United States. In fact, 48% of the population experience fear or anxiety when their battery drops below the 20% mark. There is a phobia that has been named called this. It is nomophobia. It's a fear of being detached from mobile connectivity. More people today check their phone's battery levels more closely than they do their car's gas tanks. 26% of accidents involve cars that are using their cell phones while they are driving. I will not ask for a show of hands or how many of you are guilty of that. We just thank God for His divine protection. Silencing phones actually has been proven to increase the frequency in which the phone is checked by those who have silenced it because they no longer have the little dings to let them know when somebody is trying to get in touch with them. 71% of people sleep with their phone within an arm's distance of them. 13% of people sleep with their phone in their hand. And then my favorite, 64% of people would not think of going to the toilet without their phone. 64% of you take longer in the bathroom than you need to. (laughs) Just let me take for a moment one simple application and apply it to the Holy Spirit in our lives. We live in a culture where people are way more comfortable upgrading their phone's technology and adding multiple new apps, downloading them that might make their lives easier then they are pursuing the Holy Spirit baptism and allowing the Holy Spirit to deposit His gifts within their life with power for their testimony. We somehow have developed a trust of technology more than we trust God the Holy Spirit. And the question is this, whose advertising are we listening to? Now, I am not saying that smartphones are wrong. I'm not saying that at all. I think they're necessary. But I want to touch very briefly on three points this morning. As we cultivate Holy Spirit receptivity within our lives and within the culture of our church, the first point is resisting the Holy Spirit. The second is responding to the Holy Spirit. And the third is recognizing the Holy Spirit's work within my life. The first point, resisting the Holy Spirit. We read in Scripture, do not put the Spirit's fire out. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. Many people today have been taught that they need to be very wary of God the Holy Spirit. Some of them are afraid of the Spirit's fire. Some of them have, are so afraid of the Holy Spirit that they've never allowed Him to ignite their life. And so they live in the doldrums of just thinking that God is boring because they've never let the life of the Spirit be lived out within them. And so they live in a pattern of quenching the fire of God's Holy Spirit. And it has caused me as a pastor, and and at my age I have lots of opportunity to talk to younger pastors who are just coming up and we have conversations about what it means to, to pastor the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And some of the things that we have begun to discover is this. We as leaders sometimes have warmed of Pentecostal excess so often that we have effectively quenched the Spirit's ability to work within our lives and the lives of our church. Have we reduced the Spirit's personality to just a source of energy and emotion or just as one who is supposed to work on our behalf? Have we suppressed His work of imparting spiritual gifts and ministering to the church by simply ignoring them? And if we just ignore them, maybe they'll just disappear. Or do we not teach on them or talk about them? Or do we hinder the Spirit's freedom due to a faulty view of His status as God and our failure to embrace His sovereignty over us rather than the unspoken belief that we control Him instead? And Paul tells us in this verse that God has granted to the, to the believer, each and every one of us that know Jesus as Savior, the ability to either restrict or release what the Spirit wants to do within our life. 
There is very much within the hands of each of us the ability to see God do great things or the ability to tell Him to keep your hands off. The Spirit comes with fire that is either fanned into flame so that He has the freedom to accomplish what He desires or we will douse by the water of our fear and our control and our flawed theology. But I also want you very clearly to take note of the balance of Scripture here. It tells us, don't put out the Spirit's fire, do not treat prophecies with contempt, and then there are three warnings, which brings a balance that is really necessary for us. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. I will admit to you that it is easier from a pastor's standpoint to just not allow anything to happen rather than having to test it, hold, and avoid. It requires work on the part of the church. It certainly requires work on the part of leadership in order to be able to test that which has been brought forward. We had a message in tongues this morning. We had an interpretation. The responsibility of the corporate body is to make sure that what was given in those lines up with His Word and we must test it. In other words, church, don't quit thinking and don't quit being critical. Those are valuable resources when used in combination with the ability of the discernment of the Holy Spirit. We don't just take everything. We've got to test it. But when we do, the Scripture says, hold on to what is good. It is more valuable to test and avoid the evil and hang on to what is good than to dismiss everything altogether because it's difficult. It's also easy to celebrate what God is doing when it's logical. I will admit to you that there are times when my stomach gets in a knot when the manifestations of the Spirit begin to happen in our church. Because I often wonder, first of all, we have been blessed with numbers of new people coming in, and my first thought oftentimes is, oh boy, what are new people going to think? And then the Spirit began to address me and said, you can't talk to your congregation about being afraid of the Holy Spirit if you yourself are afraid of the Holy Spirit. And I had to humbly repent. God is God. He won't always do things that make perfect sense to us. He does ask us to bring balance, but He asks us not to quench what He wants to do. And I understand, because some of the questions that I have been receiving from so many people, particularly those of you that are new believers or or those of you that grew up in backgrounds where this theology was of the devil and you're struggling, one, how can I sense the presence of God so strongly and yet find in my background that this has been taught that it's wrong? And I often talk to them about the Holy Spirit and the discernment will allow you a peace that surpasses your ability to understand it. And many people have said, it just seems to me to be so undignified and childish that I'm not sure that I want to engage. I read a quote by Bill Johnson that I wrote down because it so impacted me, and it says this, you can either have great faith or you can have dignity. You don't get both. Humility has always been a requirement for God to do anything within our lives. And as we look at Scripture, I want to show you an account where this is true from the Old Testament and uh, the, the story of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5 is a wonderful illustration of, I believe, what is a very real struggle that we have as it relates to our logic and our dignity versus the way that God wants to lead us in obedience. Naaman, as many of you know the Scripture, was a general in his army, highly thought of in the land. A dignified man. People would run to serve him. Yet, the Scripture said, he had leprosy. As a result of that, nothing in his land could cure him. He was told that he needed to go see uh, uh, one of the prophets in Israel. He went there. The prophet didn't even come out to speak to him, humbling him and humiliating him from the beginning, going, you know, somebody of my stature, I would expect that the prophet would come and talk to me. But a servant was sent out and said, here's what the prophet said. Go down to the dirty Jordan River and just dip up and down seven times. When you've done that, you'll be healed. He was indignant. In fact, the Scripture said he was angry at being treated this way. But within that, there was a spiritual lesson that was being taught to him that I believe is important for all of us. 
God will not let us stand in our own dignity when He wants to do something within our lives. There's a humbling process that must take place. Naaman said, this isn't logical. And more importantly, it feels humiliating. He was angry. And as most people do, he tried to negotiate better, a better deal. Said, listen, if I'm going to dip in a river, then I want to choose the river. If I'm going to dip in a river, I don't want my subordinates around. If I'm going to have to do all this, you know, how many of you know you can't negotiate with God? God is a way better negotiator than you are. Ultimately, those that were around him said, listen, if he had asked you to do some great thing, you would have done it. And they go, Absolutely. Something that would have built my reputation, that would have built my character rather than humbling me. And they're going, then can't you just do this? Remember, God doesn't always ask you to do things that are logical, but he has a reason. And ultimately, Naaman's obedience, his humbling himself, led to his healing. He received God as his God, and it changed his life forever. But it didn't make sense. Folks, you have to lay down your right to certain things so that you can step into the fullness of what God has provided. You can't carry your self-preservation into a move of God. It must be offered on the altar of sacrifice. It's easy for us to sing, He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord, and do so in our dignity when everything that we want from God requires that we lay down ourselves and put it in an altar of sacrifice so that in humility we might say, God, You are God and I am not. My dignity and my character and my reputation is less important than, than being in the middle of the flame of your Holy Spirit and what you desire to do within my life. And so we learn to recognize the power and the presence of the Lord. And here's the thing. Fire always falls on sacrifice. And our goal in this is not to look foolish. It's not to look dumb. But sometimes God enjoys being God. And He wants to be Lord over all of you and all that you do. So even if God is leading you by His Spirit into something that you are uncomfortable with and you're saying, this seems so undignified and you might feel foolish in a moment, but what that moment allows you is a preparation and a power of the Holy Spirit to operate in great authority in a coming moment. What He will give to you in that moment will far surpass anything that you offered on the altar of sacrifice in the authority and the power that He will give to you when He is glorified in and through you. But when something is of the Spirit, we have this ability on the inside. It's called a check of the Spirit to know whether it is genuine or whether it is false. And I assure you that whether it is me or somebody else of our pastoral staff, when the manifestations of the Spirit happen within our church, we will pastor those with the best wisdom the Holy Spirit has given to us. There have been moments where there have been people that have moved in what they thought to be the Spirit that I did not feel was genuine. I need you to know that I did not call them out publicly because I felt the better way to do that was to have a private conversation with them, allowing them the opportunity to be taught and I can tell you that in some of those meetings one-on-one, -on -one, it was really easy to determine whether or not somebody had a genuine spirit that wanted to be used of the Lord or whether somebody was walking in with an arrogant spirit that was unteachable. So please know, we are to constantly be critical, constantly think. Christians should be the most thinking people in the world as it relates to the things of God. One thing you will notice when something is of God, life will always follow from it. It will always create a situation where when God is at work, life will follow. Secondly, how do we respond to the Holy Spirit? Galatians 5.25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Note very carefully here that in the Scripture there is one that leads and one that follows. There have been times, I will admit to you, that I've asked God, would you let me lead because I think I know the path. And he's going, shut up and sit down. I know where I'm going. God is not static. He's always moving. And the moment that we decide that where the Spirit leads us is as far as we are willing to go in obedience, 
and we tell him, I won't go any farther, that is the moment that you cap your spiritual growth. It will stop right there. Because the Holy Spirit takes everything that God has given us in Christ Jesus and makes them a reality in our lives today. And He does so by empowering us with the freedom to walk in our new lives in Christ. And although God has already given us everything in the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells in us, we will not produce good fruit the moment that we stop and say, I'm not going any farther. And so we need to learn to engage Him to hear Him, to listen to Him, to obey Him, to walk with Him, and to keep in step with Him. In fact, we need to learn to be as attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we are our ability to reach down and pick up our cell phone and begin to check out the apps and what's going on there. In fact, I would feel uncomfortable If I stood before God and he said, should I tell you how many times you checked your phone versus how many times you talked to me today? How many times when you went to look something up that really that was a moment that you really needed my direction in? How many times that you've looked for other tools when I said, I'm the one that will lead you and guide you? How do we keep in step with the Spirit in constant communication with the one who is never stopping and always moving? How do we do that? Number one, never lose your awe and wonder of God. Never lose your awe and wonder. God lives in us by His Spirit. He remains God Almighty. And and the moment that we get too comfortable with that, you need to turn to places like Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 12 to 14 and just hear about God when He says this, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of His hand or the breadth of His hand marked off the heavens? Have any of you at night ever stood and just looked up in the sky going, How far does that go? God says, I can measure it with my hand. He's held all of the dust of the earth in a bucket. He's weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in the balance. Who has understood the mind of the Lord or to instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge and showed him the path of understanding? Don't ever forget that he is the God of the universe. And he knows things that you will never know. So just stop and and drink in the splendor of the Lord. And you will in a moment begin to recognize that he is worthy of your worship and praise. So don't ever lose your wonder of him. Secondly, be mindful of his presence. With absolute humility, but with unhindered boldness, realize and accept and fully acknowledge that Almighty God the most powerful being in the universe, lives in you by His Spirit. What an awesome God we serve. What a wonder He is. He does not withhold Himself from us, but He gives Himself in fullness through the Holy Spirit to each and every one of us. There's multiple scriptures that talk about this, one of them being 1 Corinthians chapter 3.16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's Spirit lives in you. And then verse 19 adds to this. That you are not your own. In other words, the moment that you made the decision to allow Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and you made Him your Savior, He then wanted to step into your life and assume the role of Lord of all. There's a lot of people that want Him just as a Savior, but He said, I want it all. I've redeemed it all. And when you do that, He then begins to live within you in the fullness of His power. In fact, to think about it this way, he never dilutes who he is to enter into us. He dwells in us in fullness. Even though we are mere mortals, God did not divide his spirit and give you just a fraction of who he is so that you can handle his presence living in you. He gave you all of him to live within you. In fact, in the Old Covenant, the high priest once a year would sneak into the Holy of Holies and hope that he was righteous enough not to die. And he would get behind the veil and there he would encounter God, it tells us in Leviticus 16. But on the day of Jesus' crucifixion, that 
curtain that separated the power of God from people was torn from the top and to the bottom because Jesus created a new covenant with us. He no longer dwells behind the curtain and he no longer dwells in temples of stone. He dwells in human temples. Each and every one of us are containers of the full power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 17, 24 says, The God who made the world... And everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by hands. If you are born again today, the entire spirit of the living God lives within you, period. And Satan can't do a thing about it. It's not a diluted version. It's not a fractional version. But the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you today and he will teach you and he will guide you and he will reveal things to you as you yield to him and the Holy Spirit will empower you to accomplish everything that God created for you to do but the Holy Spirit is a gentleman and he will not force his way on you nor will he force obedience upon you Although his power is freely available to us, your life will make absolutely no impact if you don't acknowledge his presence and let him lead. And then you need to realize that you are united in spirit with God. 1 Corinthians 16, 17, 6, 17 says, But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Have any of you ever said, Lord, I need to know what to do right now? Have any of you ever been in a situation where it looked like there was nothing but dead ends in front of you? And your path was going to go right through it and you're going, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to respond. I don't know how to provide. I don't know any of these things. But the Spirit of the Lord inside of you said, just keep stepping forward. Just keep stepping forward. Because you were united with him in spirit and his nature and his attributes flow without disruption through his Holy Spirit, through your spirit. And the only thing that you need to do is accept his gift by faith and yield to his spirit and walk in harmony with him. What an awesome privilege that I can know the heart of God and to have his desires to bring glory by obeying him and doing his work. What an honor to know that I can communicate directly with him and know his thoughts and can put them into action through my obedience. What a relief to know that my spirit is in direct union with his love and his joy and his peace and his patience and his power. The more you obey, the more clearly you will hear the voice of God. Here's what you need to know. God gives us oftentimes exactly what we ask for but he gives it to us in seed form. Go, well, what do you mean by that? Sometimes we ask for the fruit, and he says, I've given you the seeds. I need you to create the environment in your life where when you plant the seeds of my spirit, then I can grow them within you. You need to nurture them. The thing, the way that you live and the thing that you say and what you do needs to be nurtured. So God gives us his answer in seed form because he wants to partner with us in the way that he wants to accomplish his will and work within us. So sometimes we think God has an answer, and he's going, oh, yeah, you got the seeds right in your hand. Plant them. Water them in the Word. And watch what we do together. And then lastly, we need to learn to recognize the Holy Spirit. There were some songs that I was thinking about the other day, like, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Some of you know that hymn. There's another hymn that says, Count your blessings, name them one by one. You know, there's tremendous power in some of those old hymns in the way that they remind us that there is a practical impact that takes place in each of our lives when we take the time to acknowledge what He is doing in our lives and what He has done in our lives. Each year... The pastoral staff and I and and our board of deacons go through a book together to develop our leadership skills and to develop our spiritual vulnerability with each other as we want to grow in those things. And, And the book that we've been going through this year is called All There by Dr. Gail Johnson. All there. I I highly, highly recommend this book. It's not one that you read through in a night because there's so much to it that you need to digest. 
about how attentiveness affects the authenticness of our life. It's a phenomenal book. This, this past Tuesday during our board meeting, we were on a chapter, and we were introduced to something that was called the Prayer of Eximen. It was developed by Ignatia of Loyola, and it involves reviewing your day with a variety of questions. Now, here's where I want you to take your phones, and I want you to go to the notes section of your phones. Or if you have paper and pen, there's pens in the seat pocket in front of you. I want you to write these down because I want you to learn how to practice recognizing the Holy Spirit at work in your life on a daily basis. For those of you that have children and you're often wondering, what can I do at devotional time to help my children grow up in the knowledge of the practical application of the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life, then these questions will certainly help you. First question is this. Have you noticed God's presence in your life today? Have you noticed God's presence in your life today? The second question, where was God in this situation? And the moment you ask that, there will be different situations that each of you will think of instantly as God will direct it as it relates to your life. Where was God in this situation? Third question, what scripture came to my mind throughout the day? Was God trying to tell you something through a verse that just kept coming back to your mind? What scripture came to my mind throughout the day? Number four, how did I sense God was leading me? How did I sense that God was leading me? Number five, what led me toward God today? What led me toward God? Number six, looking at things maybe from a different perspective. Where have I missed God's presence in my life today? Where have I missed God's presence in my life today? Number seven, what kept me from noticing God's presence today? What happened in my life that kept him shut out? What kept me from noticing God's presence today? Number eight, what was motivating my response or my action? Boy, this is a self-revealing question. What was motivating my response or action? Number nine, what unresolved or undetected inner brokenness still drives me? What unresolved or undetected inner brokenness still drives me? And then the last question. In what ways did I self-protect? Did I hide or deny from the Holy Spirit's direction today?